good morning, everyone. So good to see you here this morning, where we've gathered to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, here at Church of the Apostles. So welcome. If you're uh, visiting us this morning, thank you for being here. And you can fill out one of those connection cards that are that you can find in the Bible that's in front of you. And this is just a good way to get connected to the church. And if you'd like more information about the church, uh, fill this out, and then I will send you an email this week to give you some more information about who we are and uh, how to get plugged in if you have any questions. Also, that's a good way to connect there. Uh, as you come in, you saw that there's communion cups uh, in your seats, so we get to uh, celebrate the Lord's Supper every week, and we'll do that after the sermon. So those communion cups are there, and um, if you want to take that connection card, you can put it in the giving box, which is by the back door uh, as you leave today. Uh, but to prepare our hearts for worship this morning, I wanted to, to read Titus chapter 3. Uh, just this sweet reminder as we uh, are about to sing, this is amazing grace. Uh, where God has taken us, uh, what he's pulled us from, and where he's placed our feet uh, on the solid rock, on the foundation of who he is. Uh, once, as we were once so disobedient uh, because of his grace and his mercy. He's allowed us to, to be his sons and daughters and that we would have a heart to be obedient to him. So Titus 3, as a call to worship this morning, says, Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil to no one, to avoid quarreling, to be ge uh, gentle, and to know and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works we've done, but by, but by us, but through his righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Lord, we're so incredibly thankful how You've taken us uh, from people that are dead and distant from You, and You've made us alive. And you've crafted us into the family of righteousness through Your Son, Jesus Christ. And we recognize it's not any of our own doing, but it's what He has done for us. And that's why we gather here this morning is to worship you, God, a loving and kind and steadfast and caring Father. Lord, help us to remove the distractions of the world and uh, just to sit on the truth of the gospel this morning and that it would uh, heal us and encourage us and send us, Lord, for your glory. Thank you for your amazing grace. And as we sing these songs, Lord, let it be uh, just pleasure, pleasing to your ear. We pray this in your name. Amen. Please stand with me as we sing this morning. Shines like the sun. 
sun in all of its brilliance, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross.
Our uh, scripture reading this morning is going to be found in Matthew chapter 5 and chapter 6 and chapter 7. We're going to read uh, a snippet from each one of those chapters as we continue to make our way through the Sermon on the Mount together, which you find in Matthew 5 through 7, Jesus' sermon there. And so if you want to follow along in the pew Bibles that are there in front of you, you can find that on page 1010, 1010. Uh, as you're finding your way there, uh, I try to say each week, uh, if you need a Bible or you know someone that needs a Bible, those are there for you to take. So we'd love for you to take that and use it or share it with someone that may need one. And so Matthew chapter 5, I'm going to read verse 7 of chapter 5 as we're looking at the Beatitudes. And so today we're going to look at verse 7 of chapter 5 that says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. But then we're going to flip over and read in chapter 6, beginning in verses 1 through 4. It says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. But truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Now I want you to skip down and read verses 14 and 15 of chapter 6 with me. It's the end of Jesus' teaching on the, 
uh, the Lord's Prayer, but he says this at the end in verses 14 and 15. He says, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And then chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, if you'd look there with me. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment that you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there's a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take out the log of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. This is the word of the Lord. If you would pray with me, and then we're going to look at that together. God, we thank you for this opportunity uh, to gather in this place today. We thank you for this beautiful day that you've created. We thank you for this place that you have provided that we can gather in your name. We pray that as we spend time in your word that you would lead and guide us, that you would teach us, that the Spirit would move in this place. Uh, We confess that we can't do any of this without you, that we need you to be the one who teaches and leads and guides us in all truth. And so we ask that you would do that today that you would take the eternal truth of your word and apply it to our hearts and our minds and our lives. We pray today that we would see clearly uh, the glorious good news of your mercy and what it means for us, what it means to be merciful people that that live out of the overflow of the mercy that you have given to us. And so we, we ask that you would show us and teach us the reality of that truth today. We pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. <coughs> I know... Uh, as I look around, and I already know the answer to this, are there any cooks here? I know a lot of you actually are really good cooks because I've eaten a lot of your food <laughs> in this room, and I know there are a lot of good cooks. Uh, I myself am not really a cook. Uh, I can grill a little bit. There's a few things I can do, but uh, over uh, early 2020, like lockdown, pandemic, everything shuts down. Uh, Asher and I, my oldest son, kind of took this undertaking uh, of trying to come up with the best chocolate chip cookie recipe. Uh, we started cooking uh, almost <laughs> daily, which was probably not good. We were making chocolate chip cookies over and over, and we were taking all these recipes that had like lots of good reviews, and we'd take them, and we'd kind of look at the different ones, and we'd try different things, and we were trying to kind of come up with, well, what's the best? What's the best chocolate chip cookie? And we got pretty good at it, but as you go through that process, you start to see the different recipes and, and which ones leave certain things out, and others do it a little different way, and Uh, Like the one that that I like the most uses dark brown sugar in it. And so now that's the way I make my chocolate chip cookies. And and so certain things, but what you find as you're cooking and you're doing that, or what I found, is sometimes I would forget something or I'd do it out of order. And sometimes that really matters, right? Like sometimes it's not that big of a deal. You leave a little something out or you add a little too much. And you're like, oh, that's better. But sometimes you leave certain things out or you get it wrong or you do it in the wrong order. And it's terrible. Like suddenly it's pretty bad. Like there were certain times where you take like the dry ingredients and the wet ingredients and and I mix something up and then all of a sudden the cookies were like crumbling apart and they didn't hold together and it wasn't right. And so sometimes when we do that, like you think about it in cooking, you get one thing out, it can really mess it up. And I was thinking about just that process and the way that works when we talk today uh, uh, and what we're going to look at today. If we get this wrong, we really distort the image of God. We distort what God is like. And we're going to look today and we're going to talk as we continue to work our way through the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount that we've been looking at for several weeks now, Uh, uh, this idea of mercy. And when we start to think about what it means to glorify God, we we say that here often, we want to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. We start talking historic confessions of the faith, the Westminster Confession, that's, that's question number one. What is the chief end of man? To glorify God and enjoy Him forever. To glorify God means to reflect back what he's like, to to make much of him, to show who he is. And we're created to reflect back what God is like. We're we're, we're created to show who he is. That's where our greatest joy will be found when we live closely with him and reflect back what he's like. But when we start to think about doing that, if we miss this idea of mercy, we really distort the image of God, the the glorifying him and pointing back. It's, It's a key ingredient It's one that if you leave out, it really messes everything else up. And so it's so very important. It's so integral to what we're looking at today as we think about it. Now, that's not to say, and be careful how I say this, that's not to say that God's mercy is more important than his other attributes. That's not true. 
God is perfect in every way and in all of them, right? And so, so God's justice is perfect and full. His love is perfect and full. His wrath, that's his righteous anger against all things that are wrong, is perfect and full in every way. But he's also perfect mercy. And all of those things operate in perfect balance. But when we're trying to glorify, show what God is like, if we leave out the mercy or we put too little <laughs> We don't keep it central. It messes up a whole lot of things. And it's so important that we hold to it. So important, in fact, that Jesus makes a couple statements here in the Sermon on the Mount that are pretty intense if you really stop and think about it, right? Even here in chapter 5 and verse 7, what we're looking at, that beatitude, the beatitudes are those blessed are statements at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Chapter 5, verse 7, blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. And there's a link there between showing mercy and receiving mercy that he's saying that those go together. But then if you look at what he says right there, and I read it to you just a second ago, after he's teaching them about how to pray, what we call the the Lord's Prayer, in verses 14 and 15 of chapter 6, he says, if you forgive others their trespass, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That's pretty intense. Jesus is saying mercy is really, really key. Your understanding of it, the fact that you, you extend it to others, that that goes directly with your understanding of who God is and what he's done for you in Jesus. It's absolutely central. And so I want us to think about this idea of mercy today and the way that we're going to look at it, and this is the way we've been going through this series, is we're looking at the Beatitudes, but then we're looking at Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount to help expound those. And so today we're looking at that, blessed are the merciful, they shall receive mercy. But as we do, this is the way I want us to think about it. First, why is mercy so very key? Why is it so important? And then secondly, I want to just ask this, and we'll do it by looking at these teachings and what he says here. Do you get it? Are you a merciful person? Have you received mercy? Do you get it in your own life? And there's three questions that's going to ask. It's kind of heart questions to really dig down to see. Do we get it? And then lastly, I just want us to end with an encouragement from what Jesus says here, right? So why is mercy so key? Do you get it? And then we'll end with this encouragement. But let's start first with why mercy is so key to everything. And so if we're going to talk about mercy, first we probably should start with the definition what does it mean? What do we mean when we say that? And if you look up kind of Bible, Bible concordance and you look at the definition, you get this uh, idea here, forgiveness towards someone whom it is within one's power to punish. Forgiveness towards someone who's wronged you, that you would be right to punish, that you actually have uh, the ability to punish, but you've decided to forgive them. That's the definition of mercy, right? And so I want us to think about it, though, in a biblical sense And we'll also think about it personally in our own life and maybe someone who's wronged us and what that looks like. But I want us to think about it in a biblical sense, what that means in the way that we should see that. And so I'm going to start here where I always start, and I think this is really, really important, and it's probably why I say it all the time. But sin is ignoring God in the world he created. All sin is against God. All sin in our life is not just something that we decide is good or bad, and we, we are okay with it, but it's sin. When we sin, we're going against the way God has created the world and the way he tells us that he made his world, that he created, that he upholds, that he sustains, that he holds together by his power. And so when we go against it, we are rebelling against God. I say that all the time because our culture tells us the exact opposite of that, that sin is, is only if you offended me and I've decided and we make that decision and it's not about God, it's about us and the way we do, right? Which is the heart of a sinful man. That's what we do. We make it all about us rather than about God. But sin is going against God and the world he created. And if we miss that, we're really good at excusing our sin. We're really good at coming up with ways to dismiss it, right? Like one of the things our culture says, uh, well, if it's two consenting adults and they're not hurting anyone, who cares? Right? You hear that regularly. You go, well, sin is actually against God, and he's the one that makes the definition of the way his world works. It doesn't really matter what we decide. It's what God has decided because it's his world. And I want you to think about that for a second. The reason is pretty simple, is that it's God's world. 
You exist because he says so. You answer to him uh, ultimately. And so if we decide that something's okay and God says it's wrong, guess what? He supersedes the way we feel about it. And so all sin is against God. And so all the ways in which we try to minimize our sin and that it's against God are because we're minimizing different parts of God's character. Right? We'll go, well, that's not that big of a deal. And why do we make a big deal of that? We'll just let that slide. Well, that's not understanding that God's holy and he is perfectly righteous and all things hold perfectly together in him. There is no letting it slide in the perfection of who God is. His burning, bright holiness, his glory, that doesn't work. But we do that because we don't fully understand who God is. And so it's really important when we start to try to get to this idea of mercy, we have to start with who God is. And so the first thing when we think about that is because God is perfect in every way and because our sin is directly against God, we actually deserve uh, his punishment. We deserve his justice. Right? That's the picture that we see throughout the Bible, that our sin is a direct affront to who God is. And when, when we do that, if you go back to the very beginning when sin is introduced into the world, when Adam and Eve sin. It breaks their relationship with God because they've shaken their fists at God and said, I don't need you, I can do this on my own. And their sin is directly against God. And because God is holy and righteous and perfect in every way, our union with him is broken. We're no longer in perfect union with him in the way that we are created to be because of our sin, because of our rebellion against him. And so we deserve his perfect justice. And so I would summarize all that to say this. Without mercy, we're all doomed. We deserve the punishment of God for our sin. And it's within his right to punish us, and he'd be perfectly just to do so. It's what we deserve because we've ignored God in the world that he's created. And that is true of every one of us. I would argue to you that you know this innately. That you know that you've fallen short, right? The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I would say that you know this. Part of the reason, I, I kind of jokingly say this, it's not a joke, but I, I say this from time to time. I go, is there anyone here that would say they're perfect? Anyone that would go, I've nailed everything perfectly, I do all of it. I've yet to meet the person that says that. I've, I've asked that question of people in conversations, I've asked that in sermons, I've asked that here. No one's ever been like, yep, that's me, I got it. I think we all know that we fall short. I think we all know that that's true. No one ever is a taker on that question. But I would even say, even if you're not a Christian, even if you don't believe that the Bible's God's word, even if you wrestle with, with those ideas and you're not sure, that you even know that you're not perfect. You know that there's something there, that there's a standard there that you haven't measured up to. Uh, great Christian apologist, Francis Schaeffer. He was a philosopher, a great thinker, he used to use this illustration to, to kind of illustrate that that's true of all of this. He says, imagine that when you're born, there's an invisible tape recorder hung around your neck. You don't see it. You don't even know it's there. But each day as you go through your life, this invisible tape recorder hangs around your neck. And every time you make a moral statement, right, you shouldn't do that. That's not a good idea. Like when you talk to your kids, don't do that. Tell the truth. Be kind to people. Don't talk back. All these things that you say throughout your life, the tape recorder clicks on and it records your own voice. And Francis Schaeffer said that you'll come to the end of your life and God will reach and he'll take, you, you could say, well, I didn't, I didn't know the Bible and I didn't know the Ten Commandments and I wasn't sure exactly what I was supposed to do and all those things. And what he said is God could take the invisible tape recorder off your neck and push play and you will be condemned by your own voice. And, and what he's illustrating when he says that is what Romans chapter 1 says. That God's created us in his image and we know innately has created in his image that there are things that are right and there are things that are wrong and we have traversed those over and over again. And so every single one of us deserves the wrath of God, the holy righteous anger of God against all things that are sin. Because every single one of us is a sinner. Every single one of us has done that in our life. And so every one of us would stand condemned by our own voice. And so what that means is we all desperately need mercy. Forgiveness towards someone who it is within one's power to punish. It is within God's power. He'd be perfectly right and just to do so. We desperately need mercy. 
The good news is that God is perfectly merciful. And so he has sent Jesus to do for us what we could never, ever do for ourselves. And so Jesus comes to live the life that we haven't lived, to die the death that we deserve, to take our sin upon himself, to pay for it. And he says, if you will put your trust in me, you will transfer your trust from your own doing, your own righteousness, your own works. And you say, no, 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 I want Jesus and what he's done for me. God, who's perfectly merciful, says yes. And he gives you Jesus' perfect life in your place. And he welcomes you into his arms. He forgives you. And he doesn't forgive you just because he goes, oh, I'll let it slide. He forgives you even though he's perfectly just because he allows Jesus to take your place and to pay for your sin for you. And so when we start to put all that together, I want you to think about what Jesus says here. If you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you. Or when you go back to verse 7 of chapter 5, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. I want you to think about that. It's absolutely central to who we are as followers of Jesus, as Christians, of those that have put our faith and trust in Jesus. When he says, blessed are the merciful, they shall receive mercy, think of it in the inverse. You don't offer mercy, you're not a merciful person because you don't know the mercy that you've received, right? Those go together. And so what Jesus is saying is, blessed are the merciful, they will receive mercy because they understand mercy because they've received it. That's why they're merciful people. Does that make sense? And so when he says here, if you forgive others, you will also forgive. But if you don't, God won't forgive you. I want you to hear what he's saying. What Jesus is saying is, if you don't get this idea of mercy, you don't know Jesus in a saving way. You can't. It's that central to who we are. We are people of mercy who have received mercy from what God has done for us. And if we don't get that, you don't know who God is and you don't know who Jesus is and you don't know what he's done for you. It's that central. So here's the question. Do you get it? Have you received the mercy of God and what he's done for us in Jesus? And I want you to look at Jesus' teaching here, and I want us to think about this together. And I'm going to warn you. We're going to read this, and you're all going to fail. Just spoiler alert. I'm about to read it to you, and you're going to go, oh, yeah, I do do that. Which is why you need mercy. And so we're going to come back to that, but I want you to really stop and think about it. Because it's so important that we see those things in our hearts so that we turn back to him again. This is so very important. Now, as we look at these teachings, I've been saying this as we go through the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is going to say some things here that are really hard. And if you read the Sermon on the Mount as this is what I do so that God accepts me, this is the way I make it into his kingdom, you will fail. And it will crush you. That's not what he's saying. He's saying this is what happens when you transfer your trust to me and you put your trust in me as your only hope, and then as you begin to do it, this is what your life begins to look like. Very different. And it's so important that we see that. So the first question here, do you get it? Look at chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, and he's going to describe kind of two different people here. He says, beware of practicing righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrite does in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that in your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees you in secret will reward you. What's the difference between the two people? Right, You see it right there in verse 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. Are you doing things so that people will pat you on the back and say, good job, you're a good person, right? I I don't have my phone, but my phone would be appropriate now. I could take a picture. Churching. I don't know if that's a hashtag or not. Here I am at church. Look at me, right? Right? in order to be seen by other people, and then everybody will like it and go, hey, look at him, he's a good guy, he's at church today. 
Is that why we come? Well, we come to worship the creator God of the universe, not for a photo op so people will go, hey, good job. But you know what's underneath that when we start to do that and we start to operate that way? We haven't fully received the mercy, the forgiveness that comes. We're trying to validate ourselves by what we do in order to be seen. And so the first question I would ask you about, have you received the mercy? Are you resting in Jesus and what he's done for you? Or are you trying to prove yourself? Look at me. I'm a good person. Look at me. I'm doing this. Look at me. I'm over here. Right? That's what he says. Do you go and sound the alarm? Right? Do you go out and serve and do things and then go, hey, here I am doing it. Look at me. Right? That, that heart that's behind that is trying to, to validate yourself. You know that there's something not right. You know that you don't measure up. You know that you're not perfect in every way, so I've got to reshuffle the deck. I've got to kind of balance out the scale so I want to do some good things so that I'm accepted. But you can never, ever do enough. And we're missing the very mercy of God that we desperately need when we seek to validate ourselves by what we do. And what I'll tell you is if, if you operate that way and you're trying to justify yourself in that way, it will lead you to not be merciful to other people, right? Because then you start getting into this, well, I'm pretty good, and they're not as good as me. I wish I wasn't like that. And then you become harder and more difficult with other people, and instead of extending that mercy, you're like, oh, I'm not going to do that. And that heart issue that's there, that you're making it about what you do rather than what God has done. But the, the opposite of what he's saying is those that go and they seek to honor God because they recognize they've received the mercy, the forgiveness of God that comes from what Jesus has done for, you, for me. And it's not me and it's not about me, it's about Jesus and what he's done and I don't have to make a big show, I just wanna honor God in everything I do. Now, that doesn't mean that you never let anyone see you doing something good, it's about the heart that's behind it. So go do good things and, and seek to honor God and show what he's like and glorify him, but don't go doing it so that people will see you. Do you see the difference? One is resting in our identity in Jesus and the other is doing it to try to validate ourselves. So that's the first one, the first kind of check question there. Are you resting in Jesus or are you trying to prove yourself? But then the second one, look at chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. Just before I read this, just so you're clear, chapter 7, verse 1, probably the most butchered verse ever. Our culture gets this so wrong all the time. So much so that it's the exact opposite of what Jesus is saying, usually. But chapter 7, verse 1, judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. And so when I say most misused passage in the Bible, we love the judge not. I've heard so many people say that, judge not. Right? Jesus said that. Don't judge me. And what they usually mean is a very postmodern view of how we get our worth, which is inward. We start with ourselves and how I feel and the way I think and the way I experience the world. And if I am doing that and I'm true to myself, then no one can judge me. Right? That goes back to my first point. <laughs> All sin is against God. We live in his world and who he is, and God is the one who will judge you. And so that's completely backwards, and we've got it wrong. But the idea, the way we use it, is you can't judge me on anything. Don't you tell me anything. You can't ever tell me something's wrong in my life. And so we use that verse to be, you can never tell me anything ever because I'm just being true to myself. But is that what Jesus is saying? No, it's not what he's saying. So it's not what he's saying at all. He's saying, judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And you start to kind of think through what he's saying here. And then he says, you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but you don't notice the log that's in your own eye. What he's saying is, when we correct one another, 
when we help each other to grow in holiness, when we speak the truth to each other, do it from a place of someone that recognizes that you have received the mercy of God, that you've got a log in your own eye, that you too are a sinful, broken person, just like the people that you want to speak truth into their life as well. He's not saying there's no judgment or there's no correction or there's no speaking the truth to each other. In fact, he's telling you how to do that, to do it with great humility, to see the log that's in your own eye and take that out first and then go speak to your brother or sister in great humility and kindness and graciousness and being merciful as you do so and then speak the truth. He's not saying don't ever do that. But what he's saying is that we're all hypocrites and we all need help. It's the opposite of the will no one judge anyone ever. But I want you to understand why it's so important what he's saying. That when we speak the truth, we do so in love. We do so as someone who understands the grace that we've received in our own lives. It's never hey, I've got everything all together and I'm perfect, so now let me tell you how bad you are. All that means, if I take that posture, is I have forgotten the grace that I have received. I've forgotten how merciful God has been to me. That's all that means when we start to take that posture, and that's what Jesus is pointing us to here. No, there's, there's a debate I've, I've heard recently, I don't know if you've heard this, but the idea of, of being compassionate and loving and meeting people where they are versus speaking the truth like they're at odds. There's theologians that argue, over, well, you can't be too compassionate, you have to speak the truth. And, and it's like, it's not an either or, I don't think. It, it's both and. You be kind and gracious and loving You share from your own experience and where you have failed. You do so with great humility, but then you speak the truth. They're not an either or, it's a both and. And I think that's what Jesus is getting at. When he says you take the log out of your own eye and then take the speck out of your brother's eye, you're doing so from a place of humility. That I recognize that I don't have it all together and I desperately need others in my life and you need me and we need each other. And so it's important that we see that. I think a good way maybe to summarize it, uh, years ago I, I remember reading a book about the, the songwriter Rich Mullins. If you know who Rich Mullins is, he, r- he wrote a whole bunch of Christian songs and uh, he, he died a pretty young man, but Rich, Rich Mullins used to say uh, that he was just one beggar showing another beggar where to get food. That he didn't have anything to offer but to point to Jesus and that was it. And that's, that's really what Jesus is getting at here. And this idea that we would help and love one another, that we would do so with great mercy, rather than becoming judgmental against, oh, well, those people are so bad, and I can't believe they would do that. Right? The, the heart of someone that receives mercy sees someone who's, who's doing something against what God clearly says and goes, oh, that's me, but the grace of God. That could so easily be me. Or, or maybe that was me. Or maybe I'm still struggling with the same thing and I desperately need God's grace each and every day. And so when you start to ask the question of do you get the mercy of God in your own life, I would phrase it this way. Are you constantly standing in judgment over people you see? Walking around judging everyone? Are you thinking, man, how can I in love help and speak the truth and love them and point them to Jesus? because I know how desperately I need Jesus. You see the difference? One is not fully resting in the mercy that we've received, in our identity in Jesus. The other, because you're making it all about yourself. But when you see who you are, it leads you to be gracious and kind. So think about those two. Last one, last question here. Kind of diagnostic of your heart. Do you see your life as your own to do what you will Or do you see it as that you have been bought with the greatest price? I'm going to ask it another way. Do you practice cheap grace? You know what that means. You ever heard that phrase before? I'll give you an example. I had a roommate. I had a PhD in cheap grace. He would literally say, in freshman year, laying in your beds together in your dorm room next to each other, 
And he would say, uh, tomorrow, I'm going to repent tomorrow. And then he'd say, once saved, always saved. And then he'd get up the next day and he'd go try to sleep with every girl he saw and smoke all the weed there was and drink himself silly. And then he'd lay down every night and go, oh, I'm glad I'm saved. Once saved, always saved. God forgive me. And he'd do that over and over. Right? Now, that's an extreme example, but this idea of that we cheapen the grace of Jesus. Well, Jesus has got me, and he saves me, and everything's okay, so I'm just going to continue to do whatever I want. Be clear. The Bible, if it's that extreme and there's no fruit in your life, the Bible says you don't understand who Jesus is. You're probably not saved. If there's no fruit in your life and you don't understand but I would say there's even gradations of that. All of us do this at different times. All of us at different times know something's wrong and we go, yeah, but God will forgive me. Or maybe we, we slip into it and we do it and then we go, oh, thank you God that you saved me and I'm okay. And we do that and we go back to that and we slip into those things. It's what Dietrich Bonhoeffer kind of coined cheap grace. God saves me and he's got me, so it's okay. It's what Paul warns about in Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Do we continue in sin that grace may abound? Right? I'll just keep sinning, and it'll just make God's grace seem that much greater. You know what he says? You know what the next verse is? By no means. How can you who died to sin still live in it? You're bought with a price, and you're a new creation, so walk in this newness of life. Don't do that. And here's the difference. Cheap grace doesn't understand what Jesus did for you, what it cost him. He gives us mercy. He forgives us, not because he just goes, I'll sweep that under the rug, because he took your place. He took your sin upon himself. He bore the wrath of God on your behalf. He took it upon himself, and he said, I will pay for it, so that I can still be perfectly just because sin has been paid for, but perfectly merciful at the same time. And when we forget that, we, we start to practice this cheap grace. Oh, God will forgive me. It's okay. Friends, when we say that, we don't understand what it costs Jesus. We are trampling on his sacrifice when we do that. We're making a mockery of the agony that he went through as he hung on the cross on your behalf and my behalf. And so I would tell you, when you start to think about that, you start to ask that question, you go, you start to slip into that idea of cheap grace. Make Jesus' sacrifice personal. He died for me. He died for my sin. He bore the wrath of God for the things that I do the ways that I flippantly go, oh, God will forgive me for that. See afresh what it costs Jesus on our behalf to be able to offer us mercy. Because when we forget that, that's when we start to slip into not understanding what mercy is like. And when we start to do that, then we don't extend mercy. Because it's become this cheap thing that's not that big of a deal. And it's so important that we don't get to that place where we're doing that. And so I want you just to ask all three of those questions. Think about them for just a second. Are you resting in Jesus or are you trying to prove yourself? Do you find yourself standing in judgment over people that are around you rather than seeking to help them, speaking the truth, loving them, carefully walking with them? Do you practice cheap grace in your own life? And maybe to go a little further on that, are there things that you know in your conscience you should not be doing? Right? If you are Jesus's, you have put your faith in him, you are bought with a price and the Holy Spirit now dwells in you and the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin. Are there things in your life that you're doing that you're uneasy about? The conviction of the Spirit in your life and you continue to do it, you're practicing cheap grace. And so think through all three of those. And I would just say to you, as you do, repent, confess your sin. And I want to end here today. That's a lot of, of heavy kind of heart things. 
And I said at the beginning, all three of us do all three of those. All of us do all three of those at different times. All of us fail in different ways. But I want to end here with the good news that God is gracious and merciful. Prophet Jeremiah writes, Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it and it's bowed down within me. Prophet Jeremiah writing after Babylon has been destroyed. And he sees the sin of his people and he sees his own sin. And he sees what's led to this and what has happened and how bad things are and where they've come. And then he says, my, control, my soul continually remembers and is bowed down within me. But then he says, but I call this to mind, so therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. And so you go through those things and you go, yeah, I don't fully get mercy in every way. I do trample on it at different times. And so here's the good news. Push into the mercy of God and what he's done for you in Jesus. See it afresh today that you desperately need the mercy of God. And as you do, God softens your heart. He shows you your wickedness, but then reminds you of how much he loves you. And the outflowing of that is it makes you more merciful to the people around you. Man, I am jacked up. <laughs> and I'm so thankful that Jesus loves me. And then when I see other people, I go, man, that guy's jacked up. Oh, he's just like me. He desperately needs Jesus, just like I do. And God uses that to soften us and to bring us to that place and to show us more what he is like. And as we receive that mercy, we begin to extend it to others, which glorifies God and who he is. So would you pray with me? God, we thank you for the glorious good news of the gospel. We thank you that you are perfect in every way, that your justice, your love, your holiness your power, your might, but we thank you for your mercy and your grace and that you hold all these things together in Jesus and what you did for us on the cross. Help us to see afresh today the mercy that we have received, that we would be people that show that mercy to others, that we would always be pointing to you and what it costs you and what it means, that we would see that afresh today. We ask that you continue to bring us from one degree of glory to another. We want holiness to mark our lives. We want to see these things of who you are and what you've done for us and see them shining brightly in our lives. So give us hearts to see you fully today. We pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. This is the time in our service where we get to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. And as we do, we're reminded of who we are and what Jesus has done for us that it was his body and his blood shed, the reason that we can be forgiven, the reason that we're a new creation. And so as we come into this time, I want us just to pause for a second as we think about those things. Bring those things with you as we come to the table today and lay them at his feet. If there's things in those questions that you go, yeah, that's me, I don't fully see the mercy of God in those ways. Confess those things and come to him and be renewed in the good news that you are saved not by your works, but by what Jesus has done. That we are saved by his mercy and what it cost him to offer us that mercy. And so Jesus, on the night before he died, tells us to do this whenever we meet, to do it continually. He knew that we would need to be reminded over and over of who we are in him. And so the scriptures record it this way. It says, when the hour had come, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Whenever, <clears throat> for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so each week we take uh, these elements. It's an outward sign of an inward reality of what Jesus has done for us. That it's by his body and his blood that we have been reconciled, that we can receive the mercy that he offers us because of what Jesus has done for us. 
And so this is the body of Christ given for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. Stand with us as we continue to worship. up a little bit this morning. We're going to do the announcements and then we're going to spend time praying uh, for a special group today uh, after I go through some of the announcements. Um, So if you're here, we're thankful that you came to worship with us this morning. The summertime is a great time for uh, you to extend an invitation to a neighbor to come and be with us and worship with us on a Sunday morning. But also we have these missional community groups uh, that meet throughout the week. And if you're a part of one of those, a great time to spend time with their neighbors, inviting them into your missional community group. 
And if you're interested in being a part of a missional community group, then reach out to me or JP and we'll help plug you in uh, to one of those groups uh, during the summer and hopefully they'll roll into the fall and uh, you'll find a little family that meets during the week that you can pray with and love on each other. Uh, but we do have a couple other announcements that's going to be going on. Uh, June 12th, we're going to have, that's next Sunday, we'll be having our uh, picnic here. So there's a sign-up sheet uh, on the welcome desk out there that you can sign up to bring a dish. And that will be uh, in here. We'll set up tables in the foyer area, but it's also our family fun day where there's going to be a water slide and all kinds of fun stuff going on out in uh, the, the grass area out here. So please plan on sticking around next week, a great week to invite someone to come and join us. And so we'll all share a meal, but sign up, make sure that we have enough food. We'll have hot dogs and stuff like that, but we'd love for you to bring a dish as well. And then July 9th, there's an aquatic center where the students and kids are going out to the aquatic center. If you're interested in knowing more about that, that's on the 9th. It's a Saturday. Uh, we will pay for the students and the kids, but if, if you would like to come, then it's $8 for adults to, to jump in on that. We'll pro be providing pizza uh, for that. And then the 25th of this month, we'll have our men's breakfast. So men, please plan on staying. Uh, come in 8 a.m. on a Saturday morning on the 25th, and we'll be uh, celebrating just fellowship and uh, time of God's word. But then a really exciting announcement. We've been planning this for a while, and, uh, and now we're going to go ahead and we're going to launch it uh, on July 10th. So that will be a Sunday morning at 9 a.m. We're uh, able to start having our equipping class. And so 9 a.m., uh, that's a class where we'd love for you to come and be a part of a time of teaching where we'll be going through an overview of the Bible. And some of us have never really thought about the meta narrative, like how Jesus is the hero throughout the entirety of Scripture. And so being able to walk through the overview of the Bible, uh, JP will be pulling some of those threads together for us, and we'll get to come and have a conversation around that as well, so bring questions. So that's July 10th at 9 a.m. We'll begin with, uh, we'll be starting our equipping class, and we'll go for five weeks. So throughout the summer, we'll be doing our equipping, equipping class, um, and that will be overview of the Bible. I'm going to pray now, but I want to invite our, all of our students that are in our student ministry, so middle school and high school, all of you, come on up here. I want you to introduce you to a lot of these, these guys. Uh, we had an elders meeting today, and Josh made a statement. like, sometimes it's good to take a step forward and then look and take a step back or look back and see where you've come from. And so this did not exist like three years ago. So all the students, come on up. If you're a student, middle school, high school, come on up, all of you. Uh, this is our, our middle school and high school uh, student ministry, Andy, and leaders, please, if you're a leader of the student, uh, of the student ministry, we get to send this crew next week, all week, 6th through the 10th, or, uh, not all of them are going, but some of them are going, to uh, camp, and it's a mission camp, where they're going to go, and they're going to be serving uh, some of those in kind of the tri-state, West Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee area, and they'll be loving and serving um, families there. And so we're, they'll be gone all week next week. So I'd like for us, JP's going to pray for them, uh, I'd like for you guys just to, one, see their faces, but also be praying for them this week as they go. And, uh, and then the leaders, the, the people with the gray hair, um, <laughs> s especially praying for them because <laughs> they're taking this crew. And uh, we want them all to be able to come back safely and serve. But, um, again, this is our student ministry. Some of them are going to camp next week, but I'd love to, for you guys just to see all of them and uh, be praying for them as the Lord continues to shape their hearts to serve to serve him. So JP's going to pray for us. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I'm going to pray, but then I'm going to pause. If you'd like to voice a prayer for them as they're going, uh, I'll let you do that, and then I will close at the end. God, we thank you uh, for the children that you've given us. We thank you for just what you tell us, that they are a great gift uh, in our lives as families, but also as a church, that they're the next generation that you are bringing up to know and to love you. And so we thank you uh, for all that you've done. We thank you for, for Andy and all the leaders that have come alongside him that are helping and, and pouring into these kids. And so we pray for those that are going to camp, that you keep them safe as they go, that you give them a wonderful time of, of growing closer to you and to one another, but also just uh, the opportunity to glorify you and show what you're like. I pray that for each one of them this summer in the things that they have going and working and, and camps and sports and everything else, that they would glorify you in all these ways, in all these different areas. And so we thank you for the grace that we see that you've given us and that you've given to them, the ways that you are growing and maturing them. We pray that you continue to bring them closer and closer to you every day.
Lord, we thank you for uh, this, this coming week, for those that are going to camp, that you'd just be with them. Give them traveling mercies as they go and they return. We pray that they would return next week just excited of what they see you doing and the ways that you're working. Uh, be with the leaders. Give them energy, uh, attentiveness, uh, just encouragement as they go. I pray that you would uh, just do a mighty work in each one of their hearts and in, in their lives. Uh, I pray for all of them this summer that they would just have wonderful opportunities. I thank you for this new group that's, that's coming up into middle school. We pray that you would bless them in this new season and draw them close to you. We pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Please stand with me as we have the benediction and then the students are going to sing the doxology. Ephesians 3, 17 through 19 says, May Christ dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow.